Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Colts Coffee and Conversation. My name is Carl. And I'm Holly. We'd like to welcome to another exciting edition of Colts Coffee and Conversation. How are you doing, Holly? I'm doing pretty well today. Thank you, Carl. Beautiful. Thank you for asking me as well. I'm doing just fantastic. You didn't allow me to have a chance to do that. Wow. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Touche, Mulfrey. Well, everyone, hello, Cole, tonight. I uh, hope you guys are doing well out there. hope you are uh, staying safe and being safe. We come to you with a very different, not a strategy, but a different uh, type of uh, podcast today. Uh, we have, uh, have a little twist and turn in here. Uh, we're going to kind of give you a little more detail in it. But uh, are you ready to talk about our new occult today? I am very anxious to talk about okay. it. Okay. So now, this is not one of the most uh, well-known groups that we've covered in the past. Where no, you it is just, not. This one, we we, were, we stumbled across it. Could you say stumbled across it? Yes, in a I certain would believe way? so. Yes, mm-hmm. because not only did we not know it, we didn't even know about this, but a person who was in this group contacted us. Isn't that exciting, Carl? That is exciting. Something different. Her name is Helen Zuman. Now, Helen Zuman is uh, not only a former member of this specific group, but she's also an author in regards to this group. And I believe she is the uh, driving force to the demise of this group. Is that correct? Yes, that's what I've heard. Okay. Uh, Now, her book is... uh, Got a pretty catchy title, which I find very, very, very fun. What did you think, Bhagwan? Yes, the title is glorious. It's I should have named one of my lessons over it. Well, tell us what the title is, man. It is Mating in Captivity. Mating in Captivity. Yes. Good job. Uh, yeah, so it's called Mating in Captivity. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get a copy of Yes, we of did, it. and I, I read it, and... Well, so Carl, what is this group that this group? That's right. We about? haven't even talked about that. But, but wait, before we even give the cheat away, okay? Before we get into that conversation, we need to discuss about our coffee. Okay. Well, today I had iced cloud caramel macchiato. Oh, fancy a cold beverage! I decided to go with a hot beverage today. I had the vanilla cappuccino. Bre- oh, shoot. Breve. Breve. I can't say that word. I don't know why. But yes, very highly recommended. Okay, there goes the coffee. Now, the disclaimer. This is for entertainment purposes only. This is all based on what we could find, based on basically everything. We, we're, we're here for entertainment purposes, people, okay? We just kind of see what we get, tell a beautiful story, or sometimes not so beautiful, and we kind of go from there. Uh, we are do not hold any degrees in philosophy or theology or anything like that we're just a couple of regular people just kind of interested in cults strange isn't it i love it okay all righty okay so we're going to talk about zendik dun 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 yes or uh also known as zendik farms zendik farms yes and what is their slogan stop bitching and start a revolution Ooh, we're gonna find out what that revolution is i'm looking forward to this are you ready holly i am ready let's get into it okay oh wait no no let's just get into it let's just get into it i don't i'm, I'm okay getting ahead of myself okay so let's talk about the leader his name was wolf zendik fancy name no that's not his real name he was actually born lawrence e wolfing in el paso texas october 7th 1920 now, he was an American author, poet, musician, environmentalist, and bohemian. He smells fantastic. Uh, he was the author of a novel, A Quest Among the Bewildered. Have you read that? No. I haven't either. And, of course, Black Hawk, Diary of an Eco Warrior, and also Zendik. Now, uh, he's described himself as an undiscovered beat. Now, Wolfing uh, founded the community Zendik, also known as Zendik Arts Farm, uh, located in a few places, uh, Southern California, Texas, North Carolina, and West Virginia at various times. Now, he started it with his wife, partner, Carol Merson, also known as Errol Wolf. After Wolf Zendik's death, Zendik Farm continued Zendik's philosophy by promoting the arts and an environmentally sound lifestyle. In 2006, the community had a show, Zendik News, on public access television channel 75 in Baltimore, Maryland. Zendik Farm members were known for their 
sales of t-shirts and bumper stickers saying, Stop bitching, start a revolution. Mm. The community has since disbanded with the property being sold. It has been accused by former members and apostates of being a sex cult, wherein Wolf Zendik was presumed to have sexual access to females in the group and was also the final say on who was allowed to date or have sex with each other. Like so many other experiments in social engineering, the Zendik saga begins with a failed artist. Wolf's father worked a blue-collar trade, and his mother was a bookie. Ooh, cool beans. Now, Wolf was a health fanatic who loved music, literature, and oddly, hot rods. He struggled to find a publisher for his writing, such as Zendik, a 900-page novel with a rebellious artist whose name means fire worshiper, or in Persian, heretic. Very nice. Then in 1959, Wolf met Carol Merson in and at a bohemian boarding house in California. Now, Errol, later dropped the C in her name, had moved to Hollywood to be an actress and passed up a chance to play one of the girls in a popular sitcom in 1962. Holly, can you name that sitcom? Yes, it was Petticoat Junction. Ooh, uh, you think that paid well? Oh, I'm sure it did because it was a hit show. Of course. He spoke about having a, a f- having a life full of love and art. Now, she played music with Wolf and became an exotic dancer to make money. I wonder... Do you think she may have should have gone back to that petticoat junction? Well, job? she should have never passed it up. There you go. And, of course, after she became an exotic dancer to make money because I believe Mr. Wolf did not want to have a job, apparently is what it looks like. Yes, that's a little sarcastic humor. Appreciate it. There was a little time for the art part. In 1969, Wolf decided to start a commune with about 60 people on his parents' small ranch outside Los Angeles. Their huts, which a neighbor once likened to something drawn by Dr. Seuss, were made of plywood and carpeting fished out of dumpsters. They attracted like-minded people to join them in communal life. They grew their own food and Mm. toured local colleges with a band to recruit. Now, that outside Los Angeles area region was Paris, California. Oh, we know Paris, California quite well. Beautiful. Go on. Wolf's philosophical explorations were equally nomadic. Christian, Buddhist, and existentialist ideas, with a lot of Wilhelm Reich and anyone else who equated sex with liberty. The crowning theory of Wolf's anti-religious religion was creevolution, or creative evolution. The notion that nature's purpose is the expansion of consciousness and that people's individual choices affect the course of its evolution. Their holy book was, quote-unquote, The Affirmative Life. He had harsh talks and writings, too. Now, the newcomers uh, surrendered most of their private property. Sound familiar? And also took fanciful names. Fanciful names. Fanciful. It's a lovely word. Fanciful names like Kel, Rev, Talon, and Saya, and some also adopted Zendik as their surname. Hi, I'm Kel Zendik. How are you? I am Talon Zendik. How are you? That sucks. All right, okay. <laughs> they formed monogamous relationships or, or went from partner to partner. However, love guided them. Each chose to work that felt the most right, uh, carpentry or organic farming, tending goats. That sounds like fun and updating the commune's website. Now, there was a hierarchy in the group depicted by wristbands. Now, you had green, which is Zendik Apprentice, which is the bottom of the tower, is how they said it. Brown, a core apprentice. Royal blue, the core itself. Gray, a family apprentice. Royal purple, family. And dusty rose, family warrior. Zendik warriors who'd stopped ascending their consciousness. There was an initiation ceremony ritual which the prospect would recite vows. Quote, As a Zendik warrior, I place myself on the truth way and vow my life and loyalty to this revolution of conscious and consciousness. I vow to become affirmative in all I find true about myself, my world, and the universe itself. To all Zendik warriors, I place myself by your side as a weapon in our righteous 
fight to victory, unquote. An amulet in the form of a Z would be placed around the neck of the new member. Although Wolf's life and work remain the commune's central focus, his death in June in 1999 at the age of 79 altered the nature of the place, the members say, as Errol assumed the leadership role, more women moved in, and their presence, along with their leadership, softened the darker, apocalyptic strains in Wolf's message. Even the housing became more spacious and comfortable. Now, every weekend, members of the community hit the streets around Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and other major cities with a mission to sell T-shirts, bumper stickers, and other merchandise embolized with the slogan. And what was that slogan again? Stop bitching. Start a revolution. Now, they worked to the crowds at rock concerts, and they protested marches, peddling their CDs and magazines. They worked the phones, cold calling, tattoo parlors, head shops, alternative bookstores, and new age boutiques. They sold and they sold and they sold their way of life, their faith, and their ideas for changing the world. Okay, guess what, folks? All of our lovely cultonites out there, that's all we got from these guys. That's all we could find on the internet. Can you believe that? That's it. So, in bringing back to this whole thing with Helen Zuman, Helen Zuman, of course, who reached out, guess what they did? Uh, they, I mean, Holly and Helen, they got to have an opportunity to have a chat. And yes, we did. We did our first in person interview. In person via the internet <laughs> and Zoom. <laughs> it was great. We had that recorded. So we are going to go ahead and we're going to let you hear our conversation. All right. Holly and Helen, take it away. I would like to welcome Helen Zuman to our podcast. She wrote a book called Mating in Captivity on She Writes Press. It's a memoir on her experience in the group Zimbic Farms. Hello, Helen. Please introduce yourself and give us an, an overview of Zendik Farms and your experiences there. Hi, Holly. Thanks so much for having me on your show. Um, so an overview of Zendik and my experiences there. So Zendik started in 1969. It came out of the hippie movement, the new age, the counterculture, started by a couple named Errol and Wolf Zendik not either of their real names. They changed their names to those names. And it lasted for 44 years. It didn't wow, that's actually... That's a long time. It is, it is quite a long time. It's way above average for this kind of group. It didn't, didn't dissolve till 2013, which was about a year after Errol died. There was, there was a religious component to the group. We had a philosophy involving cosmic consciousness. We had a mission to save the planet from ecocide and create a culture based on honesty and cooperation. We lived on, when I, when I lived there, the farm was in North Carolina, in Western North Carolina. We did have a farm. We had horses and goats and grew our own food. And we produced a magazine, CDs, and stickers and t-shirts that, that, that said, stop bitching, start a revolution. We went out on the street and to concerts and festivals to sell the things we produced in order to make money to support the farm. We built our own buildings. It was basically a, a, sort, of, a sort of homesteading way of life combined with these very intense trips to go selling to make money. Mm. As far as my experience there, I found Zendik about four and a half months after I graduated from Harvard. This was in 1999. I had received a grant through my school to visit intentional communities in North America that grew their own food. And I had been to a number of other places that first summer after graduation, but none of them had really caught me. I found out about Zendik. There were things about it that, uh, that made it stick out to me as being you know, more appealing than the other places I had been. So I went to visit thinking I would just go and check it out for a short time. And then I ended up staying for five years and becoming a true believer. Mm. I was wondering what led you to stay at Zendik? What was the things that attracted you to them? 
that's kind of a, a two-part answer. There's one set of things that caused me to get on the bus in New York City and go to the farm in North Carolina, and a different set of things that caused me to commit once I had gotten there. So what got me on the bus, part of it was, so I found, I found out about Zendik in a book called The Communities Directory, which still exists, it's still in print. It includes listings for, you know, co-housing communities, communes, all kinds of, all kinds of groups, mostly in the United States. And the Zendik listing in that book said that they had the youngest average age of any community in the world. I don't know how they figured that out, but that's what they said. And it's true, there were a lot of young people there. Mm -hmm. It said that they combined art with farming. And that was exciting to me because I was just figuring out towards the end of college that my education was woefully incomplete, that there were so many practical things, so many basic things that I didn't know about the basics of food and water and shelter and so on. But, but I was also an artist. I had majored in art in college and I, I was a writer too. I had a very thorny relationship with writing. I was a perfectionist and didn't understand it as a process, but this seemed like a great place to be able to combine both learning practical skills and also being an artist. I was also attracted to their kind of in your face philosophy about the state of the world. There was an essay on the website called The Big Lie that said everybody is lying all the time. And I was at a point in my life where I felt like most of the people around me just didn't understand me. I had just seen the movie The Matrix and I felt like I was living in the Matrix and I needed to get out. <laughs> and I thought then it was my way out. So I and and, and graduating from Harvard I never really felt like I fit in all that well there. And when I was graduating, I was just noticing how there were these, this, there was a certain set of paths that everyone was supposed to take, you know, consulting and banking and law and all this stuff. And none of it made sense to me. I just, I felt like there was something, something huge about business as usual that most people around me didn't understand. And the Zendix seemed to get it. But that was sort of the complex of stuff that got me on the bus. Then when I got to Zendik, I was just really impressed by the people. They all seemed very articulate and confident, sure of themselves. They knew what they believed in. They knew what mattered to them. They had all these practical skills. They knew how to do all the stuff that I didn't know how to do. Also, there were a lot of hot guys. And <laughs> that, was, that was excellent. And from the beginning... People were asking me, so how long, how long are you going to stay? Do you think you might move in? And when I was at, at Harvard, my, my last year, I lived in a, a co-op sort of, it was part of, it was part of the school, but it was kind of off campus. It was much more, a much more independent way of living. We cooked for ourselves and cleaned for ourselves and ordered our own food. That was the first time in my life that I really felt like I belonged somewhere because I was with a bunch of other misfits and we were, we were collaborating to sort of keep our household running. I was kind of in search of a place that was similar to that co-op, but was a, was a more permanent arrangement. And so I was looking for meaning. I was looking for belonging. And these people seemed really interested in maybe having me be there and sort of join join their group and and belong there and there was also this thing about being the elite so there were still other places on my list of communities that i might have wanted to visit but the zendix were really sure that theirs was the only way that other other communities were just sort of playing at doing something interesting or alternative, and that Zendik was the only place that was really creating a new culture. This totally appealed to my, my inner elitism. I was like, well, yeah, like what if it's true that they really do have the answer? I don't want to miss out on that. And another factor was I had this, I had this money. I had this grant money. It was $13,500. I had received it, no strings attached, but I was incredibly worried about spending the money wrong because I had never had 
anything like that amount of money before. And so I had been extremely parsimonious in the past few months. I had spent very little money. I had slept in ditches every now and then. Oh, I had hitchhiked, gracious. all kinds of stuff because <laughs> I really wanted to be a good steward of this money. And then when I got to Zendik and I was like, well, I don't really know what I'm doing with my life, but these people are so sure of themselves that they're on this amazing mission. Maybe I'll give the money to them <laughs> and they'll take good care of it. When I made the decision to give them my money, that was my commitment. Mm -hmm. That was like, I'm here. I'm staying here. I'm joining the family, the group. I'm with you for life. And then once I did that, I was, I was very much invested in proving to myself that I had made the right choice. What was the group's philosophy on achieving that change in society? The essence of Zenik's philosophy on changing the world was magical thinking. Of course, we didn't call it that. When I was out selling on the street sometimes, people would ask me that question. So how are you going to actually change the world? And I would say something like, well, it's like the light bulb, you know, everyone, everyone's using candles and then somebody has a light bulb and other people notice that the light bulb works better and suddenly everybody wants it. And, and the analogy that we were trying to make was that our way of life, like how we lived with each other on our farm and you know, practicing supposedly honesty and cooperation, that it was so obviously a better you know, more pleasurable, more fulfilling way to live, that eventually enough people were going to get exposed to it and be really excited about it, that they were just going to start living the way that we did. So that was one part of it. Another, another part of it had to do with the, well, it was related to, to the hundredth monkey theory. Errol used to talk about that theory sometimes. And to this idea that each of us living at Zendik represented a specific archetype. And our job was to evolve into a new and better kind of human. Every time I personally made some leap in my evolution, I opened a path for every other human who shared my archetype to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not a very satisfying answer because, you know, it didn't work. And I mean, over the years, the farm got bigger, it got smaller. There were scattered attempts to collaborate with other groups. For example, I think maybe when the group was in, when Zendik was in Texas, there was a collaboration with a, a group trying to prevent the installation of a dump nearby. And when the farm was in West Virginia, there might have been some other some other effort based on an, an actual concrete ecological problem, but those efforts were, were really very rare. It was very much a story that we had that, that was very strong for us. It was We had a very strong belief within our group that what we were doing really, really mattered, but we just weren't able to look at ourselves objectively and see no, we're actually not doing anything. The world's not changing. So can you go, go on about how the money was raised? Every weekend, it was pretty much every weekend, one or more crews of Zendix would get in a car, get in a van, and go either to a city, you know, we, we knew kind of in a bunch of different cities that we would frequent, the places to go, the places that had good foot traffic during the day, the places that had good foot traffic, plus a lot of drunk people at night. We would go to those places. We would go to, to multi-day music festivals like Music Midtown in Atlanta. And we would go to concerts like Ozfest or Bruce Springsteen or whatever. And we would bring with us, we called it ammo. The, the magazines, the CDs, the t-shirts, and the bumper stickers. We would just, wherever we were, you know, street corner, concert, whatever, get our stuff together, go out and just, just approach strangers, just relentlessly approach people with our stuff, trying to get them to buy it. Um, it, was, it, was very, it was very intense. We were often out on the street, you know, for 12, 
14 hours a day, depending on the scene. And we brought all our stuff with us, all our food and our water and our pots and pans and our bedding and everything. We would stay with people who supported us or just people we met in the street, only very rarely, you know, pay for a hotel. There was a lot of like kind of military talk around these trips. Like we were going into a war zone. We had our mm. ammo. We were on, we were on a mission. Um, we were going into enemy territory. So, so like kind of every minute counted. So it was like you were a Zendik warrior, right? Absolutely. We called ourselves Zendik warriors and everyone who wasn't a Zendik was a civilian. That's, <laughs> that's kind of a nicer term than I've heard other groups say. Yeah. Well, and there were other, we also called people squares. Oh, well, squares. Yeah. Okay. So what was the philosophy regarding relationships in the group? Zendik was kind of founded on this idea of creating a space for total honesty among, you know, everyone in a group. There was this idea that just two people alone, just Errol and Wolf alone, couldn't couldn't truly be totally honest just on their own. They, they needed sort of a group to hold them in that pattern. We believed in that. Of course, we didn't actually practice that because honesty flowed down the hierarchy and not up. But that was the basic thing about, you know, relationships among all people. Relationships, you know, male-female, and it mostly was male-female relationships in this case, you know, male-female romantic partner type relationships. Wolf had this idea of the protoneutronic principle. He saw the man as the proton and the woman as the neutron, and you couldn't really com be complete if you didn't, if you had any other kind of relationship. Romantic relationships were seen as really volatile. They needed to, under the constant scrutiny of the group, like the idea was that just a, a couple left to their own devices would would just, you know, fall into their old death culture programming. And death culture was the name we used for the outside world. So there was this, this constant pressure to be, quote, communicating about anything that happened in a sexual encounter or the, the dynamics, you know, between two people who were, who were interested in each other. And yeah, it was, it, there's, there was a poem that someone wrote it, published in the magazine like years before my time called called something like when I'm dating you I'm dating a group you know it was it was very much your your relationship was not yours it was it was seen in the context of this group and a lot of it a lot of how you conducted it was not up to you okay so i know in in the book you had several different relationships it appears sometimes that when you are honest it backfired on you i mean with the group would you say that or? That sounds like it makes sense, but is there some particular instance that you're thinking of? Oh. Oh, no. oh, okay. Well, I'm thinking of something. Yeah. So um, I don't know if this instance is actually in the book or not. I think it, it might not be. Well, no, I think it's referred to. It's, it's not a scene, but it's referred to. I was, I was in a relationship for a short time with a man who I call... Owen in the group. And I really liked him. You know, we were about the same age. We'd arrived at, Zen at Zendik about the same time. We had a lot of the same interests. We worked in the, we worked in the kitchen a lot together. And, and I, I really felt like this was a fun, good, upbeat connection. One time in a meeting, it was a full group meeting. It, it might've been just a living therapy meeting. Living therapy was our well, it, it was our name for criticizing each other, supposedly for the sake of helping each other evolve. Errol's daughter was leading this meeting. And I remember, you know, being all eager, like, I just, I just want to evolve, you know, I just, I just want to get better and more honest at this relationship thing. And so I raised my hand in this meeting and asked what Errol's daughter thought about my relationship with this guy expecting expecting maybe affirmation or support or something and she just ripped us apart i was like oh and and very very soon after that we ended up breaking up because 
we just couldn't withstand um, the force of, of her disapproval. Now, do you think that it would have ever come up in a different way or because you brought it up? I think it would have come up eventually. It was just a matter of time. You mentioned you found out pretty soon when you first started the group that there was a wristband situation, mm-hmm. a system of wristbands. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Each Zendik wore around her or his wrist a little um, strip of colored cloth. The color of the wristband indicated your level in the hierarchy. I didn't, I wasn't told about this hierarchy up front. I did notice the wristbands and I just didn't think they meant anything. When I did find out that they did did mean something, I was, I was very upset because I had thought I was escaping that sort of ranking by coming to this to what I thought was a, an egalitarian place. The highest level was purple, and that was, it, that was for the family. The family included Errol, her daughter, her grandchildren, Errol's boyfriend, her daughter's boyfriend, and various other people who were, you know, loyal, trusted. A lot of them had been there for a while. It also included, yeah, so it included the grandchildren. It, it included all the children. The children were thought to be especially pure because they had been born into Zendik. Then there were family apprentices. Those were gray. Those were people who were supposedly evolving very quickly. They were on their way up. Then there was blue. That was for the core. Core spelled with a K because Zendiks liked Ks. Those people had been there for a couple of years usually. They're loyal, they're dependable, you know, they're solid. Then under that, the core apprentices, that was brown usually there for a little a little less time, it's still pretty solid. And then at the bottom, green for Zendik apprentices, those with the new people. And then there was another category over on the side, pink, family warrior. Those are people who'd been around for a while, but weren't really going anywhere. They were just, in terms of their evolution, they were just sort of hanging out. The first wristband I got was a, was a green wristband, but I only ever, I only ever got as far as the brown wristbands, the next level up for Core Apprentice, because um, about a year after I arrived, there was a, a, a pivotal, a pivotal meeting in which Errol's daughter, Fawn, I call her Swan in the book, but she has a public figure, and so I usually just call her Fawn when I'm talking about her. There was a meeting at which, well, okay. Fawn didn't actually start off the meeting. Someone else did, but it, it was a meeting at which we were we were all asked to state our grievances with the farm and how it was being run. I thought this was really exciting because we could, you know, be honest about what was what was really true for us, and this would allow for good changes to happen. It turned out that it was just sort of a it was just sort of bait to get us to say things that then Errol could use against us, really harshly criticize us for. But the upshot of this, the upshot of this meeting was that Fawn showed up and said, it seems like people are upset about the levels and the hierarchy. So we're gonna get rid of the levels. We're gonna get rid of the hierarchy. After that, there were no more wristbands, but actually nothing had changed. You know, the hierarchy, was still there. It just wasn't as explicit as it had been. We all still always knew where we were in the pecking order, you know, wristbands or not. So it's kind of like everybody was frozen where they were. Well, I mean, in their wristband. During the period when we had the wristbands, you could move up to a different level I think that there, I think how I, how I went from green to brown was there was a meeting where we were supposed to say what level we thought we deserved to be at. And I remember being really uncertain about that. Like I, because the criteria, there were, there were written criteria for each level for what earned you membership in each level, but they were kind of vague and confusing. So I'm looking at the criteria. I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I'm really meeting these criteria, but then when push came to shove, I just 
looked around at my peers, the people who'd been there for about as long as I had, and I saw they were all saying that they should be then that they should be core apprentices and move up to the next level. And I was like, well, I'm at least as evolved as they are, so I'm going to do that too. So th there were opportunities to move up. Uh, yeah, but you wanted yeah. to probably make sure that you at least fit the criteria, or you would be criticized pretty heavily. Right, but it but these criteria were impossible to understand okay. you know so really I, I discerned that the safest thing was just to see what everybody else was doing and and go along with that let's talk about the group meetings a little bit it seems like you were looking forward to these kind of things you took things that they said at face value about their their beliefs their philosophy and so when you went into this initially you were like excited oh you know we can show our grievances and, and that you didn't understand that it was a trap. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else uh, knew that or not, or the, the, the more apprentice ones. Did you have several different types of group meetings? Yeah, there were living therapy meetings, which I mentioned before. What would happen in a living therapy meeting was people would be invited one by one to bring something up and you could either bring up yourself a problem that you were having or you could bring up someone else you could say so and so is doing this terrible thing i've noticed this thing about so and so or i've noticed this thing about this couple who are in a relationship and then generally when you did that other people would pile on and be like yeah i've noticed the same thing yeah they're really terrible so usually being brought up in a living therapy meeting was bad. Often just going into those meetings made people really nervous. We also had sex meetings where we could ask questions to, you know, the higher ups about sex. You know, sometimes sometimes the people answering the questions maybe gave decent advice. Often they didn't. We had for a time we had these meetings on Sundays that were kind of like church. Errol would get, get everybody together and she would give what she called raps, you know, kind of similar to a homily in a Catholic church or a sermon or whatever. She would just talk, you know, for like half an hour, 40 minutes, whatever. We would listen. She often recorded those for, mm -hmm. for posterity. We had selling meetings to figure out who was going on what trip. Yeah, but those are, those are the the basic categories of meetings. Can you elaborate a little bit on the way that you would do the dating and the mating in that group? When I first showed up, the pattern for engaging in sexual activity was this. If I was interested in a guy, I would ask one of the two dating straighters, straighter was short for administrator, to hit up, that was the phrase we used, hit up this guy for a walk, either a walk, which meant just getting together, hanging out, talking, groping, whatever, or a date, which meant going to a designated private location and getting naked and having sex. So Every, pretty much every time a sexual encounter was going to happen, it, it had to be arranged in this way. And there were also other rituals involved, like the only form of birth control we used was kind of a more, kind of an intensive version of the rhythm method, which meant that before I, before I had a date, I had to get specced by another woman, she would use a speculum, insert it, you know, into, into my vagina and check to see if I was fertile, if I might be able to get pregnant at that time. And if I was fertile, then I couldn't have sex. There was that ritual. And then also we lived in this, in these dormitory type situations, N none of, well, none of the rank and file had our own room. So we would have to go somewhere else to have sexual encounters. We had, there were a few tiny, tiny buildings on the property called date spaces. It was just a, a shack big enough for a double bed and a nightstand. And each woman was responsible for keeping a set of date sheets 
um, which would go on the bed and then you had to, you know, set up the space with the heater or and the candle and the toilet paper and whatever else, whatever else you needed. In the time that I was there, the ritual for setting up the dates did change. In the beginning, there were the two designated third parties. Then it switched to you just had to ask the person yourself, which was just as nerve wracking, if not more so. And then by the by the time I left, the rule was that you you needed a third party, but you could you could use anyone you wanted as your third party. Were you ever able to create the art that you wanted to? No, I wasn't. Part of that ha- had to do with the fact that I was a writer. I think I was, I had always been a writer, but I was basically a blocked writer. I didn't understand writing as a process. I always wanted it to be perfect the first time. And I didn't understand it as a practice. At Zendik, there was this, this attitude towards writing and other art as something that would come out good if you were honest and pure. Like all the music was improvised. So I kind of absorbed that in terms of writing. And I didn't have, also I didn't have much time to write because I was, you know, just busy with all my other obligations most of the time. I wasn't really able to practice writing or to, to do the things I would have needed to do to actually get good at it. Also, Errol considered herself to be basically the authority on any and every art form, including writing. She was the one I went to for a critique of my writing, for any editing of any piece that might have gone into the Zendik magazine. And she was not the best writer herself. She wasn't qualified really to give feedback. So I didn't have that. And then another aspect of writing at Zendik was I learned over time, I kind of absorbed that the stories that Errol wanted me to write followed this basic template of life was really rough before Zendik and then Zendik solves all my problems or, or other stories that put Zendik in this heroic role. So that's what I learned to write. But I feel like when I lived at Zendik, I kind of wasn't essentially able to produce good writing because I didn't have full access to my mind. There were so many etheric electric fences in there cutting me off from the truth of my experience. Like to me, it felt like a thought crime to have negative thoughts about Errol. I, I, I couldn't do that. And because it was, it was way too threatening to fully inhabit my experience and own my feelings, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't actually able to develop much as a writer. That struck me as kind of terrible because, you know, you, you went there with this idealistic longing to do all this that they had promised mm-hmm. and you weren't able to really fulfill any of it. Yes, but the upside is that after I left Zendik, and I eventually realized, you know, what had, what had happened to me, that, that Zendik was a cult, I immediately knew I was going to write a book about it. And because this experience had been so transformative and so incredibly intense, I was absolutely committed to this writing project. Like, I knew like, I couldn't not tell this story the power of the experience, which translated into this powerful de- desire to tell that story, then helped me persevere through all the trials of writing a book when I had never written a book before. That's great because a lot of the struggle, once you are free of the cult and you start looking back and, and you see you know, how it, you were manipulated or how things weren't exactly what you thought it was going to be, then you even push harder, I believe, after the fact to get these things accomplished or, or to educate yourself or create your art or whatever it is that you want to do. Mm-hmm. In part of the book, you did go out. You went out for a, 
a leave, like a leave of absence for a bit. Right. Were you going to go back or were you almost not going back? Well, when I, this was in 2002, after I had been at the farm for about two and a half years. At that time, this was the summer of 2002, I had just been coerced into breaking up with my latest boyfriend, even though I very much still loved him. I was really dispirited about that. And of course, I thought it was my own fault. I just felt this dullness and this heaviness. And it was just so hard to do the things that I knew I was supposed to do. And I felt like being in that state was really dishonorable. It was, it was not doing Zendik justice to be there and to be so, so unmotivated. It was so hard to make myself do the things I needed to do. So I thought that I could cure myself of this spiritual malaise by going on what we called an out. And the idea of going on an out was that if you were having trouble at Zendik and then you went out into the death culture, you would get a shot of just how terrible life really is on the outside. And that would make you even more willing to commit and work harder. And you would also see that like, yeah, no, you don't actually have any other options. And any, any idea you might have about, about a life you could make for yourself on the outside is a lie and a fantasy. So forget that. So when I, when I left on that out, it was partly just out of, out of desperation. Like I just didn't, I, I just couldn't keep going the way I was. And I did feel some, some excitement for going to Idaho where I had been before to this place, the Sawtooth Fountains that I really loved. So just feeling a spark of excitement seemed, seemed promising. But I did go on that out totally, absolutely intending to return. I just, I just wanted to cure myself of this malaise and come back, you know, better and stronger and ready to just, you know, 110% commit to being a Zendik. What led you to leave Zendik for good? I was kicked out. There are a, a number of levels to my expulsion. On, on the personal level, one thing, maybe a very powerful thing that kept me at Zendik was I believed it was the only place on the planet where I could learn how to have an honest, lasting relationship with a man. I believe this because it was part of the Zendik mythology that Errol and Wolf had been the first couple in history to have an honest relationship. And if I wanted this for myself, I had to apprentice to Errol because she was the only one who knew. So this was very important to me. And about a year earlier, I had had what I thought was my best shot at making this happen when Errol had offered to mentor me and my my boyfriend at that time. That had gone bad. Errol had eventually condemned our relationship and it had ended. And when it ended, I told myself, okay, I'm not worthy of this. I can't do this. I, I won't ever have this relationship that I want. Therefore, I will just redouble my commitment to Zendik. And if ever in the future I feel a conflict between my loyalty to a man, my loyalty to Zendik, I will choose Zendik immediately. So I was kind of choosing to give up on this thing I really wanted, this lasting relationship with a man. And I, I think I thought I could choose to give up on that. But looking back, I would say I couldn't really choose to give up on that. It was too important to me. And I think I did subconsciously lose heart for Zendik a little bit when that happened. I wasn't aware of this, but I think it was there. That was one, that was one factor. Also around the time, right, right before I was expelled, I was not doing well on selling trips. At that time, a good amount of money to make per day was about $300. And I kept making $88 over and over again. So I was a liability in, in that respect. Also, we were moving 
right around then from North Carolina to West Virginia, the entire farm was moving. And this was a huge undertaking that Errol was orchestrating. Usually Errol was really good about making her, making her shifts in story make sense. Like if she said one thing and then later said another, usually there were enough intermediate steps that it all seemed seamless. And I wasn't inclined to think that she was, you know, manipulating us. But some things happened during that move that made me made me have thoughts that I didn't usually have, just critical, critical thoughts. And I would say, so there were sort of some fissures in my belief in her total benevolence. And they were very small, you know, and, and I kind of felt like I was bad for having them, but they were there. I think it's possible that Errol may have picked up on some of that on my subconscious loss of heart. And she certainly would have noticed my selling numbers and, and saw that, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't really good for the cause. But then there's another level on which my departure really wasn't personal to me. There were many Zendix over the years who were, who, who were, you know, who were forced out and, how that worked on a on on the group level was that every time one person was told to leave those who remained got another another shot of proof that they were truly the chosen ones they were even more chosen than they thought they were because because look that person couldn't make it but you're still here and also they got the message that they had better you know work even harder or that could happen to them. Mm -hmm. It's very much like that. <laughs> that I don't know if you read that story, The Lottery by Shirley Jackson, where there's this town and like every every year there's a lottery and every family gets a, a sheet of paper and on one sheet of paper, there's a black dot. And then the family that gets the black dot, each of those family members gets a sheet of paper. Again, one black dot. Mm -hmm. And the person who gets the black dot gets stoned to death. And in, in, in the story, it's not stated, but like, but there's this, there's this sense that the agreement that these villagers have about doing this lottery every year is part of what keeps them together. To me, getting expelled from Zendik was impersonal in the sense that I simply ended up with the paper with the black dot. Well, that's uh, interesting because one of my questions was, if you were in charge in Zendik, what do you think their reason would be for expelling you? Yeah, I mean, I think if, if, you, if you had asked Errol that question, she would have said, well, you know, Helen's, Helen's just a pain in the ass and she's <laughs> not coming up with it. Um, actually, when I, when, I, when I left and I went to say goodbye to Errol, she said something like, you know, you've just never really under, you, you've never truly understood this place. Like, like it's something about having it, having it, having intellectual understanding, but not really understanding it in my heart or something. So she would have said things like that because she, she would not have been able to, to admit or probably even know what she was doing for the sake of the group's cohesion and for the sake of keeping, keeping people's, you know, loyalty intact. What are you doing now? I live in the Hudson Valley, north of New York City, in a little, little city called Beacon. I live here with my husband, and we have about a quarter acre, and we sort of homestead on it to the extent that we can, you know, growing food, stuff like that. I'm working on a novel that is a total mess. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the first draft. That's what it is. And I have, you know, various other, other writing projects that I'm always working on. For most of my money, I, um, I work as an editor for a college admissions consulting company. And I'm still just very much trying to understand what the hell is going on here in life as we know it. Well, that sounds very interesting. You know, um, I enjoyed reading your book. You're a very good writer. Um, you know, you. you know how to describe things. It was very intense at, at times. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's really from 
you know, your point of view, your lens on what was going on at the time. I've never heard of this. Of course, it was pretty small. It was in California. It started in California and was in a number of different locations in California, including Topanga Canyon and Boulevard, which is outside of San Diego. And the first farm was in Paris, P-E-R-R-I-S. Well, the funny part about that is that I spent time in Paris, California. Uh Um, I lived there for about six months in the um, early 90s. Also, I think in the Topanga Canyon and all that, that was in the late 60s? The farm started in 69 in Paris, so Topanga probably would have been in the 70s, Ah, maybe the 80s. All right. I was just trying to think. There's a lot of other groups that were contemporary, you know, at the Mm -hmm. time. Okay. Well, how are people able to buy your book? My book is available wherever books are sold, Amazon, bookstores. Um, Bookshop.org is actually a great place to buy books online if you don't want to patronize Amazon. You can also go to my website, HelenZuman.com, H-E-L-E-N-Z-U-M-A-N.com, mm-hmm. and go to the signed copies link, and I, will, I can send you a book directly that is signed by me. And on my website, there's all the links to all the places you can get the book. It's also in a number of libraries. And if it's not in your local library, you can request it and they might just get it for you. Oh, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Helen, I thank you for taking some time out and being our first live guest on our podcast. I'm really appreciated uh, everything that you said. And I hope our audience will take a look at your book, buy it, and also be aware of certain controlling groups that we're trying to, you know, make people aware of, or not just this group, but the tactics and and maybe, you know, just to be a little more cautious of what they're joining. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been a quite a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Wow, Holly, that was fascinating. Yes, it was a very interesting and fun interview. Mm -hmm. I really appreciated Helen to tell her story for us. Yes. Thank you, Helen. Yes, I'm also truly grateful for you. First of all, for you reaching out to us and, and kind of giving uh, say an eye-opening experience with this group because we would have never found this group if it wasn't for you. So then that's pretty much it for everything else, Call Tonight. So we hope you enjoyed this. I know it was a little bit longer than what you normally are, but we just could not split this in two parts. There's just no way we could do it. So Once again, thank you for reaching out to us, Helen. We do appreciate it. Now, if you guys want to reach out to us, we do have, of course, our usual, our Facebook at Colts Coffee and Conversation, our Twitter at Colts Coffee Con 1, Instagram, Colts Coffee Convo, and our email address, Colts Coffee Convo at gmail.com. And we also have one other audio message. Holly, take it away. Yes, record your audio message on your smartphone and send it off to Colts Coffee Convo at gmail.com. All righty, and on that note, Good night, Holly. Good night, Carl. Mm-hmm.